work uh, is our work that we're going to present today is on learning object representations uh, from pixel data. So as Subutai already said, we're from Ghent University, a small uh, group in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, we, we also affiliated with IMEC, uh, which is probably a bit more recognized. So IMEC is a research center on nanoelectronics. So there they do a lot of um, um, semiconductor research. And with them, we work especially together with the hardware teams that uh, develop um, specialized uh, chips for yeah, AI workloads, which is like, as you all know, synonym these days for matrix notifications. And, uh, and also with their sensors team. So we were also do some work on high frequency radar. So, uh, but our team is more focused on the learning part. Um, and, um, and basically what we want to do is to build intelligent agents. And early on, we, we realized that if we want to build something intelligent, then there has to be embodiment. And so we, we quickly switched from doing just software to also starting off a robotics app. Okay, so, uh, so these are some pictures of the lab. So we have some robots that drive around or can fly around. So these are basically more focused on, on navigation. And we also have some robotic arms that, that can move around with an in-hand camera in their confined workspace. So these are type of um, systems that we work with. And regarding- This is a the, big lab. Approach, it's a big lab. Sounds like you're in a pretty big, looks like you're in a very big warehouse. That's, that's really nice. You have a lot of space there. Yeah, so actually it's, uh, it, it, was it was designed as a data center. So the, the room next door is similar size for, for the whole university data center. And this room was actually uh, commissioned to be the, the, the also data center. But until they don't have enough uh, servers to fill that room, we can, we can put our robots here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So yeah, so in particular, we work on um, on, on on an approach uh, for our intelligence agents. That's also uh, inspired by neuroscience, which is uh, active inference. Uh, uh, and in this talk, I will first um, uh, highlight uh, what it is and how we, in particular, implement it on, on our systems. And then for the second part, Tom will talk about uh, his research where he applies these principles uh, on this, on in, in particular on a robotic manipulation scenario, so on a robot arm, uh, which resulted in in an agent that was able to do some visual foraging uh, in the workspace. But then he realized that there were some shortcomings, and he ended up with uh, the third part of the presentation, which is our uh, what we call the cortical column networks, uh, which is basically um, heavily inspired on the stuff that will be uh, uh, well known to, to you guys. So um, let's uh, kick off with the first part, unless there are any questions. If there are questions, feel free to just interrupt me or, uh, or flag it. So, so active inference is basically a, a process theory of the brain. So unlike uh, what you guys are doing, they're not looking inside the neocortex to figure out uh, how is everything working internally, but it's more like uh, if, if we have a brain, what would the thing uh, as, a, as, a, as a whole be optimizing? It's kind of saying this, this is kind of the potential uh, optimization scheme that the brain does. So in short, it goes like this. So your brain or an intelligent agent builds a generative model of its environment where the generative model is basically uh, depicted as a joint probability distribution between uh, sensory observations for outcomes O, uh, actions A, and some in states S. So basically, your agent uh, resides in, in its environment. It can do some actions on this environment, which will result on some sensory outcomes the next time step. Now, what the agent tries to do is to come up with some internal state representation as that should kind of represent 
the, the, the hidden causes that, that give you the, the sensory outcomes. And that's that kind of model how actions influence the environment and how uh, these hidden states then give rise to your novel sensory outcomes. And the optimization of the generative model is then uh, by minimizing the so-called free energy, which is, which is basically an upper bound on your surprise or, or, or prediction error. But yeah, we'll, we'll delve into some the, the more rigorous math in the next slide. But what is, what is crucial here uh, in the whole active inference idea, uh, I think, is that not only you use this, uh, this objective to, uh, to learn or to, to, to train your generative model, but you also use this to, to select your future actions. So basically, the principle says your agent not only minimizes free energy for, for updating the model, but also it will select actions that uh, the agent thinks will minimize the expected free energy in the future. And this is uh, a nice characteristic, uh, I think, because it basically renders perception, learning, and, and action under, uh, under one, one object. So how, how does it then uh, work uh, mathematically? So basically, the free energy is, is, um, um, is defined as follows. So it's basically the expectation of uh, the difference between two log likelihoods. The second term is the generative model, so the log likelihood of the joint distribution. And then the first term is basically a variational approximate posterior distribution. So what's happening here? Well, what you want to do as an agent is not only have a generative model so that you can predict what's going to happen, but you also want to infer from the past sensory inputs you got, which state you're currently in. But the problem is even if you have a perfect generative model, getting this posterior is typically intractable because it, if, if you use Bayes rule, you would, you would just have to uh, integrate over all possible outcomes. So it's it's very hard to do and, and just impossible to do in general. So the, the idea is that you just, uh, and, and this technique is, is, is basically called variational inference. It's, it's well known uh, probably for the machine learning uh, people uh, with you. It basically says, okay, instead of trying to get this, this true posterior distribution, I just replace this by a simple distribution Q over the states, uh, and I just optimize it. Uh, and I make sure this is something very simple that is easy to optimize. For example, you, you, you make it Gaussian, for example, and you just try to figure out what are the means and the standard devi deviations that's, um, uh, that are close to this uh, true posterior. And basically what you can prove is if you, uh, if you minimize this term, the expectation term, then it basically boils down to maximizing the log evidence for your model. Uh, and at the same time, you're uh, minimizing the Kelder version between this approximate posterior and the true posterior. Uh, so if, you're, if you have a machine learning background, then this thing is basically known as the evidence for bound, uh, what, which they use in variational autoencoders, for example. So uh, it's typically the same thing. Um, and what is nice is that decomposes into two terms. First term is basically say, okay, if I minimize my free energy, what I do is I minimize the KL divergence between this approximate posterior and uh, what we call the prior. So it basically, um, what are the states that I think uh, I will visit if I only know my actions? So it's basically you close your eyes and you think about if I do these actions, which are, which are the states I will visit. And you want to be, uh, you want these states to be as close as possible as what will I estimate if I have my observations. So uh, you basically want to have a good model both to predict and to um, to infer your state. And in order to make sure that uh, that there is information in your states, you also um, have the second term, which is basically kind of a reconstruction term. You try to predict given a state. What, which kind of sensory uh, inputs will I, will I see? Uh, and this is kind of a reconstruction term. So you constantly try to predict your, your next sensory uh, input, basically. 
And as I said, uh, uh, for the action selection, you 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 want to also uh, minimize your free energy, but then the free energy for uh, future time steps. And then uh, two things change. First thing uh, that changes is that now in the expectation, you don't know your observations yet. So for the past, you already saw some observations, but now you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you also will take an expectation over uh, whatever outcome or sensory uh, data you, you, you might expect. And the second thing is that you also didn't act yet. So your actions, you still have to choose them. So everything is now conditioned on the policy uh, by, which is basically just a shorthand for any action you will do in the in the future, basically. So, be, but because you didn't do the action yet, you don't know which which one it will be. So it becomes a condition. And then in the second line of the equation, we do uh, two. Uh, we make assumptions to make this practicable. And the first one is that we basically assume that in the future you have some prior um, some prior expectations of what you will see. And this is basically saying I have some preferences. I assume that I will reach, that I will see these things because, because that's my preference, basically. I will reach my goals. That's what it says. Uh, you can also interpret it as kind of more uh, homeostasis kind of thing, where you say, hey, uh, I expect my body temperature to be uh, around 36 degrees uh, Celsius. So regardless of, um, of what my actions are, I always um, assume it will be this way. And by encoding it like this, it will basically uh, enforce or encourage your agent to, to look for actions that will actually visit the state. So it, be, it becomes kind of uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, let's say. So we call this the instrumental value or realizing your preferences, or you can also cast it as rewards, like in a, reward, in a reinforced learning agent, this would typically be your reward signal. Um, but interestingly, there's a second term, and here we make our second assumption. It's basically here we assume that um, our approximate posterior is actually pretty close uh, to the true posterior. So we just assume that we did a good job at modeling the world, and then we can replace this p uh, with a q in the in, in the second term, and then use what what arises is basically an information gain term. So you want to visit states that after the expected sensory inputs, you will know more about your state, basically. Uh, so this drives uh, uh, your agent to explore or to, to gather information about the environment or some epistemic value. So in with the mod, uh, what happens if we actually want to implement such, such a thing in the real world? Well, basically, um, what we do is we we instantiate three artificial neural nets, uh, which we call the encoder, the decoder, and the transition model. So the encoder basically takes as input your previous state, the action that you do, and uh, also your sensory input. And you try to infer uh, the state distribution. So it's kind of a probabilistic state representation, uh, saying, yeah, which state am I in now? The transition model. Um, similarly takes the input, your current state and your action, but it, it lacks the observation. So it doesn't know the sensory input. It just predicts, if I do this action, this is the state I will end up in. So it's kind of what you, what you use for selecting the best actions, what will, in which state will I end up if I do this or that. And now finally, the decoder will then predict the sensory observations that you see in particular states. And so you train this thing by interacting with the world and then minimizing the prediction error uh, of your decoder and minimizing the gal divergence between uh, what you thought would happen according to the transition model and what you think uh, has happened after observing uh, your sensory outcomes. So in some prior work, we, uh, we tested this on a number of environments. So the first environment is the top left is the, the, the car racer. So basically you have this, this cart and the, the goal is to, uh, to, you can trust it left or right. And the goal is to, to reach the mountain. 
But the only way to reach a mountain is to first get some momentum because you don't have enough trust to just uh, get up the mountain uh, for the first time. So it's a hard exploration problem uh, in RL. And what you see is if we, if we train an agent um, uh, using some, 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 some data and fits uh, the journey model, what actually happens is it learns to predict the outcome. So here in the right, you see in blue, what, what you expect to happen if you trust right. And the red is what you expect to happen if you first trust left and then trust to the right. And you can see that early on, uh, it does not know which momentum uh, it has. It, 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 it's like it gets a push, but it doesn't know in which direction. And, and it doesn't know. So, it, so even if it trusts to the right, it might expect to get there but most often it thinks yeah i will not i will not get enough momentum to to go up the mountain however if i first go to the left these are the red curves and probably i will end up there at some point and you can see how the beliefs shift that at some point if it's it's to the left enough then then somehow at some point it decides yeah if i now trust to the right i will always I will always reach the top so then it switches its behavior to Trusting to the right. The second um, environment that we then tested was to have some more uh, complex inputs, basically uh, this car racer environment. So here you have top-down view of a car racer, and you have to race uh, on the track. And we basically now train the model where the observations are the uh, the pixels, the raw pixels of the of the game, and you basically uh, can can steer left or steer right. And then you can see that it actually learns to uh, <laughs> to raise it back. So here you can see. So so re remember that I I told about uh, this preferred state. So here we say the preferred state is to be in the middle of the track. And so that's why you see this behavior that if if there's a a, a tight corner, it will tend to skip the the corner because that's the way. To get to the preferred state, which is in this case being in the middle of a track rather than um, uh, getting a high score or, or something. Um, and then finally, we also tested this on um, on real world uh, robot data. So uh, we had one of our robots drive around in our lab, and so here what you see is basically the robot imagining what will happen if it does some action. So you can see it's a bit more blurred. But for all the sensory modalities, it makes uh, sensible predictions of the robots turning inside one of these uh, small ales. So you can see the camera modality, the LiDAR scan, and this is a range Doppler map coming from, from a radar, basically. So with this, um, uh, we are at the point where we introduced our active insurance method. We showed that it works on uh, a number of environments, and now uh, we switch to one particular environment, which is our uh, our robotic manipulator. And I'll hand over to Do. All right. Um, is everybody able to see my screen now? Or yeah, that, that's, yeah. That's right. Um, okay, so in the in this particular environment, we want to apply the same principles Tim just talked about um, to a setup with a robot manipulator. So in this case, um, we have um, so we have a, a robot manipulator in simulation on a on a on a workbench, um, and the the goal is actually to also learn um, a model of this environment in which the robot can act. Um, so this this environment is set up with a manipulator with an in-hand camera. So uh, to the gripper, a camera is mounted, and the agent is the robot. So by activating the robot, the agent can move the camera around and observe the environment from different viewpoints. So the goal here is to also learn um, learn a model of this environment so that it can know where each object is, and by having a prefer a preference for a certain object, for example, knowing where it should grasp it. So in, in, in this sim simple environment, we have a, a table and the objects can either be a cube 
a bar or a sphere at random positions, random orientations, and in random colors. Um, so similar to previously, we have observations, which are O tau. And in this case, it's, a, it's pixels of the enhanced camera. You can see them in small on the left of the figure. Uh, the actions here are the absolute viewpoint of the robots. So the, the camera viewpoints, the, the position in uh, absolute coordinates of the, of the camera is, is here, the action by moving to this position. And the state space is a 256 dimensionally learned Gaussian distribution with a diagonal covariance matrix. So uh, a quick question there. Uh, when you say the action um, is the absolute viewpoint of the robot, is that it, which reference frame is that? You, you're saying you're giving a position in some reference frame. What reference frame is that in? Yeah, now uh, it's within the absolute reference frame. So with respect to the robot base. Table. Okay, so it's not from it's not in the camera. It's not the viewpoint. It's not the camera reference frame. It's the actual external reference frame. So it has to do implicitly. We'll have to do some sort of a transformation to exactly. get from position. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. That, so that, yeah. Also, I, why is it called an action? I mean, uh, I mean, how how's the viewpoint an action? I'm missing that. Is that like, is that like where I want the viewpoint to be, and then the the arm goes to that position? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it's it's not a it's not an action as in terms of flexing or extension or rotation. It's it's just say, hey, my action is to get to this viewpoint. Bingo. That kind of thing. Okay. And does it know its own joint positions, or it doesn't know the joint angles or anything? No, it, it does not care about the joint angles. It's just uh, the uh, position and orientation of the camera. Okay. With respect to the robot base. Okay. Um, so, so it's it it uses first of all there is a, an encoder model, uh, which will encode then the observations and the viewpoints as pairs in. Uh, into this um, state space model that is actually a, a, a 256 dimensional Gaussian describing the global, the, the, the global state of the environment. So the, the positions of the objects with respect to the global reference frame. And, and these are encoded all separately and then uh, integrated in, in each other using a Kalman-like filter. Um, and then when, when an estimate is made about this, um, this environment, you can sample from this distribution and by choosing a new action or viewpoint where you want to, from which you want to observe the, the environment basically, uh, you can decode it into an imagined view. And this is shown um, to the right of the decoder. So in the center, there is this imagined view where, there, where you can see a black sphere, a black square and a yellow bar. Um, and this can be used, for example, to, to drive the instrumental value, uh, which Tim also talked about. So if, you, if your preference or your preferred view is, is, also, this, uh, is also this view, then, then this will have a, a large instrumental value, or this instrumental value will have a large weight in the free energy. Um, and then secondly, the, the encoder is used again, because from this imagined view, you can also re-encode it into the belief of, over the environment or over the work or over the workspace. And then you get a new distribution describing the environment, imagining that you would have visited this novel viewpoint. And then you can, so that, that is marked by the blue arrow here, then you can compute the epistemic value or the expected information gain over this term. And you estimate how much you expect to learn by visiting this novel viewpoint. But it's basically the scheme of our first work in the uh, using the robot manipulator. So we, we can then learn 3D manipulation models from an enhanced camera. So we have observations in the left and then on the right are reconstructions from the same viewpoints. So initially you can see that it, it's predicting gibberish because it, it really doesn't know anything. It has observed only a single thing. But uh, when more observations are added, uh, you can predict accurately the following ones, or more accurately. And then as, the, as more information is added, the model becomes more accurate. For example, when it observed this blue bar entirely, it started to reconstruct it correctly here. And then, 
And then this model can also be used for visual, visual foraging. So again, by minimizing the expected free energy um, and by balancing this epistemic and instrumental value, we can provide the agent with a preferred observation, such as this uh, blue uh, square here. And initially, it does not know anything about the workspace. But when, when we drive actions, initially, it will go up to a high vantage point to observe the environment and to acquire more information. And once it knows where the, where the blue um, cube is, it can move towards it. And secondly, when, afterwards, we can use this model by querying a continuous space of use, and we can move around in the imagined space of the workspace. However, this, this, this model still has a lot of limitations um, because, uh, it, because it all uses, um, because it uses a lot of data to train. So we need 8,000 different scenes of different configurations where only five primitive objects are used. Um, this model uses a recurrent information integration, which is a bit slower. And it also requires for a long training time. So we're speaking of in terms of weeks of training for this, this model. Uh, and then it's it, it, because of the, data requirements, we can only really do it in simulation. And this does not really transfer well to the real world because it's not realistic enough and we cannot uh, accurately represent a real world object. So, um, so this is what, why we needed a different approach to, to how, we, how we represent these, these kind of things. And, then, um, and that's how we got into what we call the cortical column networks, um, because we took a lot of inspiration from the thousand brains theory. Um, so we, we wanted to build an elementary sensory motor structure, which we can train in a unified way, which we can replicate over and over. So if we need to learn more different objects, more different things, we can um, add in more of this same component. So this is uh, similar to the vertical columns in the neocortex. Um, and then we want to model as well how the sensor will move with respect to the object. Uh, and uh, so work more in the object centric reference frame rather than a global one, because then the, um, well, it, it, it's more difficult to learn all different possible configurations of the workspace rather than with respect to the object. And then finally, uh, we want to in integrate information over time uh, by a voting mechanism and not by a recurrent mechanism, because then the information of the past will not be forgotten as easily. So in, in the end, we will create a CCN or a closure column network structure, which takes an input pixel based observation and will vote for a particular object identity and a sensor pose in an object local reference frame. But to do this, we, we needed to modify our setup because it, it could not be done right away in the, in the setup we, ha we had previously. So we are now considering um, nine different objects of the, of the YCB data set, which is a known data set for <laughs> robot manipulation. Um, and so now we have an environment in which we have a, a single object with identity I. So in this case, this is the sugar box and an, uh, a simulated camera, which is a camera with viewpoint VT or the viewpoint at time step T with an observation OT uh, corresponding. Then the actions now are a translation and a rotation of this camera viewpoint. And applying this, this relative transform to the viewpoints, we get a new, new viewpoint VT plus one, again, with a corresponding uh, new observation OT plus one. Uh, and we can also um, describe this in a generative model, uh, which is also necessary for, the, for using the active inference framework. So here in this generative model, we have, um, well, we have the observations O, which are dependent on the object identity, which does not change over time. So it's a, a variable that say, remains the same. And it depends on the viewpoint of the camera, which does not does change over time uh, given an action. So the viewpoints depend on the previous viewpoint and the action um, applied to it. And now, once we have this generative model, we want to draw inference about it. So when we have an observation OT, we want to know, for example, 
which is the object. So we, we want to infer the object identity given our observation. And we also want to infer the camera pose given our observation. So how do we, how do, we do this exactly in, uh, in, in practice? So I have another. a question on the previous slide. Um, it, it sounds to me like here the viewpoint is still in in the camera's reference frame, or the it's not in the object's reference frame the way it's described here. Is that is that correct? Or um, well, the viewpoint is in the object reference frame in the sense that the object is always at the center of the. The view and because of the transforms are being relative, so um, because, okay. because the ones are relative, the, the transforms is in its internal reference frame, basically. Okay, okay. So the object is always at this given center yeah. location. Yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, but be, yeah, but because the the actions are all relative to the view, it's, it's it doesn't not, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter exactly. Okay. Yeah. Also, here the the agent does not know viewpoints per se, so it has to infer them, and by the, the and, and these representations, as as will will come apparently in the next slide, will also be learned. So it has no, uh, it, it has no longer an X Y Z and a quaternion representation of the viewpoints. It just builds a representation and learns how uh, an action will shift. Uh, in this learned representation. Okay. Yeah. And the action selection is, is random. That changes from viewpoint zero to one. Um, well, the action selection is still based on active inference, but I will get to it later. So for for learning the model, initially it's random, but then uh, later for inferring a, an identity or for moving towards the target post, it will uh, be driven through the active inference uh, free energy function now. All right, now I'll go to the next slide. Um, so so how, we do, how do we do it exactly? So we, when we have an observation of, for example, in this case, the cracker box, OT, uh, we encode it through our encoder model and this will output two different distributions. So first it will output an object identity or what distribution. And this is actually just a binary Bernoulli distributed variable, which will be, uh, which should output one in the case that this particle column network is dedicated to uh, cracker boxes and should be zero in any other case. So for example, if I would input a mustard bottle, then it should be zero should output to zero. And secondly, it will, it will describe the, the observed object pose in a, uh, again, in a state space of a, a Gaussian distribution with a diagonal covariance matrix. Um, and uh, please note that, it, that this does not, is not a, an explicit representation, but it's implicit in the sense that it's never matched to the, so that, that is just a, a latent representation of this pose. And then um, we can sample from this distribution where we have a, a vector describing the object pose. And this can be decoded back into an image uh, or into the expected observation O hat of T. Uh, and then we can apply an action, which is the, or we can apply an action to the sampled uh, vector V hat of T uh, and apply it um, and transition this to acquire a new distribution over the, the pose, which is in the, in, the, in the same latent dimensions as the, uh, the where distribution. So, so this is a single um, CCN as, as we describe it, where we have both the identity and the pose in a separate uh, distribution. Um, and then we, we use these to, or we, we, we optimize these using the free energy functional again, um, so the, the first term equates to what uh, Tim described earlier, but then with a specific generative model, I described a few slides back. Uh, but in essence, it's come down to three terms. The first one focusing on object classification, 
The second one focusing on the optimization of the pose estimation term. And then finally a reconstruction error on the, um, well, yeah, on the observation. Um, so these, these CCNs are then used for, uh, for, voting, for voting for object identity. And, and this is done because each CCN actually only has a single uh, output variable. So when we acquire a new observation, we pass it through each of the different CCNs and we acquire a prediction for each one. And then um, to, to convert this to a, um, to a distribution, we push this through a softmax function and acquire a categorical distribution. So in this case, the, the, the final one is the one that describes it as a MUG, and then this will be the, well, this should be the, the largest value. Can I ask, can I ask a question? I, I missed a basic idea here. What is the difference between different CCNs? What, what is there? Oh, how, yeah, how I, those you? I, I might have forgotten to say it. Um, so each CCN focuses on a, uh, on a single object. So yeah, here. So if they, if they so each one is trying to recognize a particular object. Yeah, exactly. Um, so then, how would they vote? Because they they can't. They're just they're just basically competing with one another in a sense. Yes, exactly. So because each CCN is uh, trying to identify the correct object or the, the its its corresponding object. If it's if it would re, re, um, if it would acquire an observation of a different object, then it would output a. A small value in this distribution, so it would be very uh, well. It would it, it should be unsure, unsure about, or it should not. How do I say it? It, it should not. Uh, it should output a zero for observations that do not belong to its category. Yeah, but but then they they really can't vote to reach an agreement, right? Because it, they're in some sense each is competing with one another. Um, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So the the CCNs are the single time step are not necessarily voting they just cost a single vote at a single observation in, in our implementation but then over time we will accumulate votes uh, to create a more accurate prediction um, but it, it's it, uh, this is not to be critical but it's it's kind of fundamentally different than the way we've described cortical columns in the brain yes which are which are all voting on the same sets of objects and from different viewpoints. Here, you've dedicated a column to each object and accumulating evidence over time for each one independently. Uh, I think. You're, yeah, I think you're right. Um, and we, we also uh, discussed this, or we also mentioned this in the discussion uh, that we, we did, we took some inspiration of it, but we're not modeling the cortical column exactly. Uh, that's fine. That just makes sure I understood. Thank you. Have you thought about doing something where each cortical column is looking at a different segment of the in input space? Um, uh, we, we have not yet done this, but we, we did think about using not necessarily on different in, uh, aspects of the input space in of the camera observation, but we did think about doing it with different sensor modalities. Oh uh, yeah, that, that would be this. Yeah, that could be work too. That would be, in some sense, uh, that would be more interesting in some sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because now we, we assume that the entire retina or the entire pixel observation is actually a single sensor rather right. than just. Yeah. Um, and I missed, uh, I, I may have missed something also with the encoder and decoder networks. What are they? Are they um, deep learning systems or you mentioned the output is Gaussian? Um, yeah, that's, so they're, they're deep learning neural networks. Um, typically, so the, the encoder is a convolutional neural network, the decoder is a, also a convolutional neural network, and then the transition model is a feedforward neural network. And okay. it, outputs, it outputs a distribution by predicting the mean and the variance separately. Okay. And you, and you train the whole thing with backpropagation uh, as once as full joint training thing? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's trained end to end. Um, all right, so, and then, uh, well, so this is how the CCNs uh, make a single vote, uh, or uh, our type of vote. And then we want to um, in, uh, aggregate information over time. So aggregate the predictions over time as separate votes. 
And we, we do this because we have now a set of categorical distributions. Uh, so we model it as a Dirichlet distribution as a conjugate prior. Uh, and uh, the parameters of the Dirichlet distribution are basically the votes that are acquired over time. So, um, and then because we want to, we want to drive our agents to choose viewpoints to um, improve the classification accuracy as fast as possible, uh, we choose them through the minimization of the expected free energy G, which is again um, a term that unpacks in three terms, where the first one is the state preference, the second one is information gain on object identity, so how much will it learn uh, in terms of object identity when performing a given action, and the final one in information gain on object pose. And because we now care about object identity, we will look at uh, um, yeah, this term exactly to, to drive our agents forward. Now we can see that um, given more, more views or by choosing more views, the accuracy of uh, predictions improves over time, uh, given our compared to an agent that does not move. Um, but more interestingly, we, we also look at the, the views that the agent actually selects. So we can see that, for, for example, for this uh, blue can, it chooses a view where the can is clearly visible and it can clearly differentiate between the logo on, on it. While the, on the right, you can see the view that it most certainly did not select, so the view with the highest free energy. And that's just the top of the bot, uh, of the can. So it could be a soup can, a uh, Pringles can, a uh, MasterChef can. So that it, 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 it's very ambiguous and, and it is re clearly reflected in these observations. Uh, a, a second example is on the bottom where you have the blue markings on the mustard bottle while on the right, there is just a yellow blob which could be a banana or something else. Um, and then uh, as a second use case, we also, use these models to, to drive our agent towards a preferred pose using active inference. So a, a, a desired pose, for example, for grasping is um, where we can now provide a visual of an object and then it will drive or it will find the action that will move the camera to view that exact visual. So again, we minimize the free energy, uh, but this time with, uh, well, with respect to the action or the relative transform on the camera pose. Uh, but now we look at the first term, which is the, the state preference on object observation. And then we can see, so for uh, in the top row, you can see the targets. Uh, in the second row, you can just see some random movements in imaginative space. And in the bottom row, we show that uh, a trajectory chosen, chosen by the active inference agent, and it always moves the object into the, the target position. So in the discussion, we, we now have some, some separate learning of what and where from pixel-based observations in an object-centric reference frame. Um, we, we based ourselves on the principles of the active inference framework and the thousand brains theory. However, it's clear that these are not cortical columns uh, as, we, as we operate on the complete sensory inputs, as we discussed earlier. Uh, and we also focus on one single object category rather than multiple categories and separating on um, well, different sensory inputs. So it might be more like a mini column, but I, I might be wrong here. And yeah, I, I probably would. Uh, yeah, I think technically that's probably not correct, but yeah. yeah. Right, and um, yeah, we also do not have a hierarchical distributed or sparse representation or it's more, it's more a dense, dense representation uh, in our case. Uh, and our, our future uh, ideas are to, to put these objects in the, in the actual robotic workspace. And then if the, if the object is recognized, we can use it to, to do a certain task as, as preferred. Or if it's not, we can inspect it and capture data and train a new CCN in a more continual learning kind of setting. Um, so this was the, the presentation. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you. I'm curious about the static versus the dynamic chart that you showed. How, how was the stat? How did you do the static network? Um, the static system. Uh, 
which static system do you mean? Oh, you had one where you're allowed to move and where it's not allowed to move. Uh, yeah, you showed that, that the accuracy charts over the number of views. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, we just initially picked a random pose. So the, the, the static agent is, is actually the, so the first step is exactly the same as you can okay. see. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and we just picked a random initial observation for uh, the nine objects in, I, I, I forgot how many settings, but we, we sampled a lot of different settings to acquire our, um, our confidence bounds. Yeah. And the accuracy is still pretty high for the static agent with 92%. Yeah, exactly. it, it, I wonder if it would be different if the objects were more similar in some sense here. You know, if you have a color in with the color, you could probably tell a lot apart. And, and maybe if the objects were much more confusing, that it might be even a greater separation potentially. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's something we, we also plan to investigate further. Yeah, Can you look at like a confusion matrix to see what the errors are. Um, that might be interesting. Yeah, in some sense, by picking those objects, you might have made the problem easy, too easy. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you said uh, previously the training took uh, weeks. How is it now with the new setup? Is it faster now to learn? Yeah, in this in this current setup, I think uh, for one CCN, it trains like three or four hours uh, on the same hardware. So it's it's it requires way less data because you don't have the you don't have to learn the global reference frame because it's all in the same uh, space. In the, in the last experiment, how do you define the preferred pose for a given task like grasping? Yeah, by by a single. Um, so this is done by the by providing the pixel based observation. So then we, we provide it by the observation of an object in a given pose. And then we say, okay, um, now encode this, then you get a, a pose, then you get the distribution over the pose and then it will find actions that minimize the distance to this. To this. So, so basically we sample a lot of, a lot of actions and then we, 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 we see which ones match best and then we refine basically. And did you test the previous setup also on, on this task with a single object um, just to compare or only um, on the table setup? Yeah, we did not do this because we have a completely different environment. So, well, I guess we could, we could have trained the, the old model um, using, using absolute few points as well. But yeah, we did not uh, compare this. But, but then it would take for weeks again. <laughs> okay. One of the things I found really interesting to think about what the sync your talk is, is something we're working on too is or thinking about is you have sort of a, a detailed biological model and what aspects do you maintain, what aspects don't you maintain as you're trying to build something practical. So it's interesting to just observe your choices um, which are, you know, some of them are quite non brain like at all, right? So, um, but, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's an interesting question that we have to deal with in the long term. Um, and I, it, this is just a very high level observation that it was useful to me to see what you're doing because you've made a certain set of choices. You come from the three energy principle world and you like to keep that, um, you know, so you're trying to, you're trying to fit that in the thousand brain theory. Other people may come from different directions and try to fit that with a thousand brain theory. If you come from a purely biological direction, you you might not do any of those things. So um, not that one is right or wrong, it's just interesting. So to me to see this was a very useful exercise, which I appreciate. Um, I think we're also looking at it from, from your side as what we have now, how might we move even more towards the direction of biology to 
to, to check whether it might even work better. <laughs> so um, we're discussing a lot internally whether we should uh, look more into the another neuron model that you, you guys propose that has more uh, uh, that has nice characteristics on, on learning or in the oh, We're doing the same more. thing. We're we're doing the same thing here right now. So. Yeah, we're trying to figure that out too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I, I think we're on a sort of a, a forefront of things I think are going to be a, a pretty confident and be pretty essential in the future of robotics and in AI. And just, you know, we're, we're discovering and trying to figure out what's important, what's not. In, in this case, uh, you know, if I understand the, the way you're doing it, the, if the object is on its side or some, you know, the object itself uh, changes, it doesn't matter at all because it's just completely in the reference frame of the object, uh, the, the way you're doing it. There's, there's, there's really no notion of the object being on its side here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Have you tried, uh, I guess one going back to some of the stuff we were discussing earlier. Have you thought about keeping the same setup but allowing each cortical column to model multiple objects, um, and what impact that might have? Because now I guess it, as you this is you might have a scaling issue now that as you add more and more objects, you need more cortical columns. But if you were able to keep a fixed set of cortical columns but allow each cortical column to model multiple objects, um, in, you know, there might be a, potentially a scaling benefit of some sort. Yeah, for sure. Because also you could, you, you, you could suppose you have really a lot of, a lot of objects and you, you, so let's just pick a number. So suppose you have 10,000 objects and you have thousands of cortical combs or, or, yeah. or cortical networks and you have each one of them uh, learn about let's say 20 objects and then then it would be more like casting votes as in a thousand brains because then each cortical column that was that knows about one of the 20 objects will cast a vote for that object but then the the exact um, Bits that turn to one in the in the thousand votes, or then more like a sparse representation of that particular object. Uh, yeah, but yeah. In, order, in order to read that, we'll have to scale it to a lot of objects. So that's the that's a challenge. Yeah. There, I think. That's a challenge because of the yeah, time it takes to train. Well, yeah. So we we probably first need ten thousand. Objects we can render from generate data sets. <laughs> oh, I I don't know why you need so many objects. I mean, it seems like you could do it with a limited set of objects. Uh, I think the idea here is to distribute the learning of the objects over multiple columns. Each column could learn a different set of objects, subsampling from the entire set. Um, and and so you know, each one has a limited view of the world. I know ten, you know ten, someone else knows ten, but we're all we're, the ten we know are different. But it doesn't seem like you have to have thousands of objects to make that interesting. You, could, you know, you could have hundred objects and still be pretty interesting. But the, yeah, I mean, this benchmark has something like 180 objects, I think, or something, because we looked at the same benchmark before. So that you could try that, and some of them are are confusing. The, the, they are quite similar to one another, and so that that could be a good test case. Yeah, and another another question would be then how how do you how do you select which objects get assigned to which color? You could do it randomly, or you could... well, I think you know in the brain it's it's not random. In the brain, it has to do with where they are connect, what they're connected to, what part of the, the sensory array it's connected to. But in a non-brain-like way, you could just say you can just say you can just randomly subsample. You know, so you you say you have a hundred objects and you have uh, fifty columns, whatever. You could just say each each column it's going to randomly we're going to randomly subsample from the 100 objects and each column learns whatever some number and it would still be a very interesting exercise in the brain it wouldn't be like that i mean some columns in the brain are going to be like their vision columns and their hearing columns and their touch columns and they're representing different parts of the sensory array 
Um, but you don't need to do that here. That um, it would be still a very interesting exercise. We were just talking yesterday here about how we could introduce the concepts of voting into uh, machine learning systems that are not full brain-like, right? So th this, that's what we're talking about right now. Is you could say, okay, we have multiple modeling agents. In some sense, they're all equivalent, but they just learn different subsets of the of the objects in the world. And how would that, you know? Cause, and then you get then you get voting in the sense that everyone who knows about the coffee can or whatever it is, well, they'll get the vote. But um, uh, but you have this sort of interbreeding of votes because it's a distributed, randomly distributed. Um, distribution of models. It, it would be very interesting. I don't think it could be a lot of work. I'm not yeah. telling you what to do. But <laughs> that, would, yeah. that would be a, an interesting direction to go. Yeah, the, the only tricky part, I think, in our setup right now, as it is right now, is that now the, the reconstruction decoder prints very fast and very well because it's, it really just knows this one object. Whereas if you would if every column would encode uh, uh, a multitude of them, it would also have to encode somehow which particular object of these ten should I reconstruct now to be to be correct. So it, it will have a harder time to to decode, and it will have, need some some part of or another latent space or some part of the the viewpoint latent space that we use now to to encode this. So I, yeah, definitely. I well, that gets into the details of how you're doing this. I don't, you know, the free energy principle stuff. I'm not, you know, not detailed, familiar with it. But another, another thought you could think about is that, and I don't know if this applies to the way you're doing it, but you could say, okay, each, if I'm, if I'm distributing the model of the, the, the chips can onto different columns, some subset of the columns, then those models somehow could be inferior. That is, they could have lower resolution. They could have, um, they, it, they, can, they don't have to be as good individually, right? Um, and just like some of your visual columns in your cortex, they look at very large parts of the input space in the retina. And those are going to be very fuzzy. They're just not going to be very detailed, right? But they're still useful. Um, and so in that sense, you might be able to make a bunch of columns that are simpler uh, and take, take less time to train or have less resources. Um, again, I don't know, I understand the, the way you're modeling the columns well enough to know if that's possible. And I, I, I see what you're saying that it could be difficult to have model multiple things, but that would be a definite way you'd want to go, or at least the way we would want to go if we were going to work on this, uh, is to get the columns to model multiple things. Doesn't, they don't have to model a lot. You could just model a few things, but you have to get to work that way somehow. That would be, uh, I don't know if that's possible using the way you're doing it. I think so, yes. It's definitely, definitely worth, worth investigating. It sounds very interesting as well. I mean, another uh, possibility is, you know, and this might be closer to what a cortical column might do in biology, is that it becomes more of a generic encoder for visual images. Um, you know, it picks up on, you know, the visual features that are cuts across all categories. And then the representation, can you can use that representation to decode. Again, it might not be completely accurate, uh, but it'll still be close enough. It should be able to reconstruct any visual image uh, at that point. Um, yeah, so that's another kind of direction to go in. Yeah, that, that's also something that we, that we thought about on, because now every cartridge problem has to learn some basic things over and over again. Yeah. To kind of get, get some more shared uh, parts in this, this thing, yeah. One thing I saw in the paper looking it up, well, one thing I realized, I was like, oh, these are like capsules, where each capsule, it stands for one object. That's, that's where, where like cortical columns, that's not what, what we do. Capsules do one capsule per object class. And then I see that you pointed out the same thing in the paper. But I'm just drawing that connection in case people didn't notice. Um, but, no, but I, didn't, I, I didn't understand that about capsules. That's interesting. Yeah, no. yeah, the, they'll dive it. And, and Jeff Hinton made the same connection to many columns that, that he sees, he thinks of a capsule as being like a mini column. Well, I, I think that's absolutely not true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's someone speaking, not knowing what many columns actually look like, but, um, but it, it's okay to say that with inside of a, you know, I don't know, you could say there's a subset doing something. So there's like this, you could think of this as like capsules, but with movement and a, and a sort of voting that kind of resembles our voting. And that makes it interesting to think of it that way. I mean, there's, we've looked at, you know, at capsules and we think, well, okay, that's pretty on a far 
it's pretty far removed from the thousand brains theory, but there's some things in common, like they're trying to get capture some sort of relative position of things. Um, and then you've, and, but if, you know, the capsules have no concept of motion at all, right? And so you've got some concept of motion here. So these are also inter intermediate uh, things. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, also, as far as I know, the, the capsule does not have like the concept of a reference tree. It's more like, um, yeah, every capsule learns about some features that it's, yeah, should, should then um, have it in the, in the 2D image. There is some sense of where is it in the 2D uh, image, but it has no sense of like, I'm in this 3D space where I can look around uh, this stuff. So. That's fair. I, I think the original paper planned to do that, but then the later capsules paper, I think you're totally right, got away from that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question on voting. Can you explain that your audio was a bit on? Uh, so right now, each color column represents an object, and then you're voting by taking a softmax over a Bernoulli variable. Uh, how are you going to vote when you, each color column represents multiple objects? Because then you can no longer do that, right? But yeah, so so if every so how I would see it is every column represents multiple objects, and instead of doing the softmax, you would just um, you would just get the the output of the Bernoulli and maybe maybe even cap it to to zero or one, and then you take the the vector of all your uh, columns. So suppose you have hundred columns. And every column will have a zero or one output. You concatenate these in a vector, and then hopefully this will be a sparse representation with only a few ones for the columns that know about the object that you're seeing. Oh, Well, any other questions? Well, actually, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have a follow up on that. Um, how do you back propagate with that? The, the, the idea that you just gave. Yeah, so I think you can still train each one separately. So, um, so each each cortical column will be trained on the set of objects that it knows. And it will treat other objects as negative examples for the Bernoulli variable. Uh -huh. So then you, you you train each column in, in isolation uh, using that prop. All right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is just top of our minds. <laughs> guess oh, no, guess yeah, what? Yeah, so, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to discuss? I think we we got a lot of a lot of great inputs already. So thank you for that. Um, I also say let's keep in touch and uh, and, and maybe uh, maybe we can co collaborate on this or, or um, send send over a student for an internship or something just to. Uh, yeah. We, we, that, that is something we've done a lot in the past, um, pre-COVID. Um, we could do it now too, uh, but uh, uh, we're really open to that. We like that kind of, uh, you know, having someone sit here for weeks or something. <laughs> it's useful. Yeah, that would be cool, I think. So just, uh, that's, we're certainly open to that and we can host them. Um, again, I just want, I want to thank you guys for doing it. I think it's really fascinating. Um, to see how you take some of these ideas that we've come up with in neuroscience and apply them to machine learning. It's, as I said, stuff that we're trying to figure out how to do too, so you're ahead of us. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. <laughs>